Good morning, Hyde Park Union Church. Let's pray. Creator God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This was the ritual. Every Monday and Wednesday at 10.05 a.m. precisely, or there were tolerable consequences. Students would migrate to the church across the street from Spring Arbor University for chapel, a disproportionately large free Methodist church somewhat affectionately called the mothership. I don't remember who spoke, where he was from, it was usually always a he, or what his deal was, but I remember his message was on the power of prayer. Through his ministry, he had seen murderers walk through the doors and come out and live good lives, who became pillars of their community. He had seen people who were addicted walk through the doors and through the healing power of prayer, never pick up drugs again. Thanks be to God. He had seen homosexuals. He had seen one for real. Yep, he'd seen one before. He had seen homosexuals walk through the doors of his church and through the healing power of prayer, walk out and live good straight lives. And then his message continued on. This was the ritual for all Spring Arbor students and this was specifically the ritual for the queer Spring Arbor students. Go to chapel, sit through chapel where the speakers assumed that nobody in the good Christian audience was not heterosexual and not cisgender. Leave and go get lunch at the Cougar Den. Rinse, repeat, but not that day. Upon my matriculation at SAU, a small free Methodist college in rural Michigan, I had believed I would be the only non-straight person there. I was wrong. After that chapel message, November of my sophomore year, I walked away feeling for some unspeakable reason, uneasy and unwilling to go to my triple back-to-back -back classes. My ally, my good friend Simone, told me to take it easy, go back to my dorm room if I needed to. But I decided to go to lunch. And I decided to sit in the windowed room facing the library, also kind of affectionately known as the fishbowl, where I could see through the windows my comrades, other queer students, my friends, gathered on the steps, with a rainbow pride flag unfurled. This was a flag that was at the epicenter of a conflict between two of those friends and the school student life administration. My friends were adamant about putting their, door, putting their flag up in their dorm's room window. Administration was adamant to not allow students to hang flags that made political statements, though there was a flag for 45, if you know what I'm talking about, in the window of a dorm room my freshman year, 2016. Anyway, my comrades and my friends sat on the steps with the flag unfurled, scattering rainbow light on the concrete of the walk up to the Hugh and Edna White Library, just sitting and chatting, laughing, being seen, being visible for once. We're here, we're queer, get used to it. I finished my lunch and quickly joined them and people passed as they walked up the steps, only offering, only speaking to offer support those who didn't approve kept walking, except for one. She was what the kids would call a Karen, an older white woman characterized by her contradicting, non-threatening appearance, but thoughts, behaviors, and actions that have consequences that reap death for those for whom she has disdain. She approached and she asked what we were doing, why we were protesting, what we were protesting. And when we told her that we were protesting a homophobic chapel sermon, remarked that the man probably wasn't against homosexuals, but sodomites. Now, if any of you can make sense of what that means, please let me know. Because it doesn't make sense in any way what happens next in my mind is a blur. As I remember it, an argument erupted between this woman, a member of the community, not affiliated with the university at all, but who used the university's library, and all of us, all the queer students. But I was the loudest, a closeted sophomore student. It was a theological debate. I remember her standing at the top of the stairs and my standing at the bottom. And after having in participated in such a heated theological debate, I understand now why St. Nicholas may have slapped a heretic, may have. All throughout the argument, her position was unmistakably that being queer has consequences. Being queer to her can lead to nothing but death. Eventually the Dean of Students approached and the protest dissolved. I went to my next class, Dr. Paul Patton's script writing class and cried for an hour. But what had happened was the physical manifestation of competing theological narratives within the Christian church. One narrative that people like me, queer people, 
are committing a capital S sin by being lowercase s sodomites. A narrative that being queer is something that, like the chapel speaker asserted, needs to be fixed. That being queer leads to death, that queerness bears bad fruit. The other narrative, mine, that people like me, queer people, are made in the diverse and vast image of God, our beloved, that their queerness, our queerness, makes us unique and powerful two competing theological narratives. See, a reformation is coming. The Christian church must decide and can no longer waver on whether or not it affirms or denies the image of God in queer people. This is the question, isn't it? The church argues over few things with as much or more fervor. There are churches, thanks be to God, that are on what I believe to be on the right side of issue, right side of the issue. They practice and believe in theologies that affirm queer people meaning that they believe we don't have to be fixed. This is one of them. Hyde Park Union Church is publicly and openly affirming, and once again, thanks be to God. But for churches to be publicly open and affirming is not enough. Having so long borne evil fruit to give to the souls of queer folks is nourishment. If the now open and affirming church, and all churches for that matter, want to be serious about queer inclusion, and they should, if they want to mean it when they say all are welcome here, they must make room for the way that resilient and resourceful queer folks forage for new fruit. And it must annihilate the roots of the tree that gave queer folks rotten fruit to begin with. So what do I mean when I say fruit? I'm talking about what Jesus was talking about in the scripture that was read today. What is born as a result of our effort of thought, action, or behavior. It's a pretty easy metaphor to get. In the case of queer inclusion, theologies of queerness are embodied theologies because they impact and influence the livability of one's life, especially if you are queer in one's body. In light of the resurrection, this Easter tide, we are concerned with the livability of life in one's body, of the body being unbroken and made new and transcendent of death. See, the fruit of these theologies is tangible. And the quality of that fruit is contingent on whether or not these theologies permit queer people, people like me, to live as their wholly affirmed selves. And in the case of the woman on the steps, I believe she was bearing, once again, rotten fruit. Now, what do I mean when I say the ways that resilient and resourceful queer folks, and I say resilient and resourceful specifically because the gay liberation movement was started and most radically championed by street queens of color, people like Marsha P. Johnson, people like Sylvia Rivera, who fought and struggled to survive in a world violently opposed to their existence. But what do I mean when I say queer folks forage for new fruit? An American Baptist chaplain and queer theologian, the Reverend Dr. Cody J. Sanders, details this phenomenon in his book, Christianity, LGBTQ Suicide, and the Souls of Queer Folk. In the fifth chapter, Religious Resistance, he lays out the reality and response to theological narratives around queerness that bear rotten fruit and these narratives and their effect on the lives of nine queer folks who had attempted suicide. He asserts that leaving the church or rejecting religion doesn't rightly portray the reality of those who were left by their churches. These nine queer people he interviewed personally identified with the imagery of a spiritual exodus or migration. In my own life as a queer person, I relate deeply to the stories of the desert mothers, women who left mainstream Christianity when it no longer worked for them, thanks Constantine, and went away to the desert to make their own weird and eclectic and individual practices of mystical faith and spirituality. In order to be serious about inclusion, the open and affirming church needs to make room and space for the fruits of that weird and eclectic and quintessentially queer spirituality. It must prepare to be challenged by the rituals that ground and affirm queer people, one of which you can see on the altar. Hello, these are bi pride flag colors. It must prepare to be challenged by the rituals that ground and affirm queer people. It must be ready for a non-binary God, for a God that fits neither male nor female categories or both. It must be ready for drag performers and beautiful grand hats to show off their femme realness or to be wearing three-piece suits and to bind their chests. It must be ready, it must be ready for the occasional cheeky spot of syncretism, for tarot readings and crystals and manifestations. Now, it need not necessarily adopt these practices to the canons of their church, but it must make room for the ways that queer people seek to find meaning outside of the regimented and fundamentalist expressions of the religion that hurt them. 
See, for example, Sylvia Rivera, who I mentioned before, a pioneer trans activist who's present at the Stone whose presence at the Stonewall riots and as part of the Gay Liberation Front were radical. Back in the days of Star, which that street transvestite action revolutionaries placed an altar at the front of the house so that when the young drag queen she housed each night left to go hustle in the streets because they had to, they ask a blessing from St. Barbara. To Sylvia, Martin Duberman recounts in his book Stonewall, St. Barbara was obviously the patron saint of gay Hispanics. Sylvia is reported to have said, we were watched over. Though Marsha came close, Marsha P. Johnson came close to getting killed by tricks a number of times. And I looked down the barrel of many a gun and would say, shoot me, you'll be doing me a favor. I won't have to pay no rent. But my saints protected me. Her Catholic upbringing had rejected her, but she was adamant in instilling the spirituality in the girl she raised as a mother and practicing it herself. She may have been left by the church, but the church did not leave her. By being at least open and affirming of practices that give queer people life, like praying before hustling, the church must also take queer people where they are and allow them to be, as Dr. Sanders writes, transgressive theologians for the livability of our own lives. The church must believe queer folks when we say that we are spiritual people. Spirituality that might look a little bit different, but still radically prophetic spirituality. Spirituality that makes do. Spirituality that holds its own, as Dr. Sanders writes. Finally, we come to the roots of the tree that bears the fruit. In the words of my friend, the inimitable Caitlin J. Stout, who was there on the library steps that day, if the fruit of your theology is death, then you need a new theology. If the fruit of your theology of sexuality, queer or not, is death and destruction, then you need to reevaluate your theological priorities. We all do. I am reminded of the way that a certain state let 89,343 people die of AIDS in their country because it was a gay disease. Congress members waving Bibles in the middle of session, believing that gay people were beyond salvation, one of whom, a man named Joseph Walter Fairclaw, is interred in the backyard of my house at Brent House. And I remember Leela Elkhorn. I remember when she died. She was a transgender teenage girl who died by suicide after being sent to Christian conversion therapy. And that's not all. 2021 is a groundbreaking year for the wrong reasons, for anti-trans legislation, as Pastor Sarah brought up. More than 45,000 trans kids will lose gender-affirming health care. And this is not a political issue to me. This is a matter of our souls. This is a matter of what theology we believe in. Non-affirming theology, and that is such a nice way to put it, non-affirming, is lethal. It bears lethal fruit, and we have seen that time and time again. We need to be a place that deliberately sows seeds for fruit that will nourish queer folks. We must begin to ask ourselves, what does queer inclusion not just look like as a fun little thought exercise, but what does it look like in praxis? What are the tangible fruits that we envision our theologies to bear? See, we need to be deliberate. And following the sermon today will be a discussion on LGBTQ soul care. What practices can we discuss and brainstorm to make this place, to make Hyde Park Union Church a place that makes the livability of life for queer folks not just possible, but a thing of great joy? What can we do to help queer people hold their theological own, once again, as Dr. Sanders writes, in a world that is opposed to them? These are questions we must be asking. We can no longer sit idly and ask, do queer people have a place in my church? Because yes, we do. We have been here. We have always been there. We are asking you now to show up and acknowledge our prophetic capabilities in creating theologies of inclusion. And I think back to that week after what happened on the library steps my sophomore year, I think about walking into Dr. Paul Patton, just the, the kindest man who's on this call today, his, his script writing class. I mentioned that I cried for an hour, but what I did not mention was that Paul allowed me to tearfully hijack his lecture to talk about how the institution that he represented was hurting me. He made space for my grief. And later that week, he invited me over to his house in a, just a great act of hospitality for cabbage soup that his wife, Beth, a clinical therapist made. And they let me sit and they let me talk even more than I had already talked. He made space for me to not make sense as a person, to not make sense spiritually, and to cry, most importantly, and to cry softly into my soup and to be comforted. 
and that was not the last of their care of me. Later my senior year, after leaving a difficult housing situation, Paul and Beth would graciously take me into their home as they've done for so many other queer Spring Arbor students and just Spring Arbor students in general. I spent the summer after my senior year, and this might freak some of you out, but that was only last year, living in their basement. I found out that I was accepted into seminary in their basement. Paul's wife, Beth, was the first person I told. Paul, who had, was always just a great source of encouragement, was the second. The neighbors, third. My mother, the fourth. I call them my bonus parents, and they have done for me what the church needs to do for all queer people. Make space for us to grow and bear fruit. Accept us as radically prophetic and spiritual people who will make your ministry in your church more vibrant and reaching. Reject the narratives that bind us rather than liberate us because see, Paul and Beth were not always affirming. You can change. Please walk with us and affirm the path that we're on because ours is a path. They'll finally know that no queer path is the same. The queer experience is not monolithic. It is as vast and as diverse as the God who made it. The queer experience is not monolithic. Again, for example, my friend Scout, whose poem you heard earlier, their mother was friends with my mother. We grew up in the same denomination. We attended the same Free Methodist College, yet Scout's path is different than mine. I followed the queer to Episcopalian to mystic pipeline. Scout found themselves in the Orthodox Church and finding great peace within it, within it I hope. They assert within the poem, Chrismation for a Lesbian, that neither path, the normative queer path of rejecting religion versus the lowercase o orthodox path of rejecting queerness is for them. What they choose is a personal God, a feminine God. And they choose their own path down which to carry their cross. The cross that they carry is made from a tree that bore them fruit and bore it beautifully. May we be a body of people whose wood of the crosses have borne fruit like that too. Amen. <laughs>